Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man who has a word of advice for everyone. Don't forget where you came from, because that's probably where you parked. <laughs> it's Dale. <laughs> Ain't that the damn truth? Yeah. You wouldn't believe how many times people lose their cars. I think we parked next to that light pole. Man, one time we went to Charlotte Coliseum, and I knew exactly where I parked. I came out, I couldn't find my car for shit. <laughs> we walked and walked and walked and walked, and finally had to wait till about parking lot cleared out. Guess what? I didn't park where I thought we parked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst of my moved the car. Yep. <laughs> Trying to find a landmark, and it doesn't work at all. No, not at all. Mm, what's going on, dude? Well, well, I guess we just worried about our friends down in Florida at the point. Yep. Um, I guess by the time this episode drops, the hurricane will be moved on out. But, yeah. Um, but at the time of this recording... It just ran through Florida and hit, headed toward the Carolinas. Coming our way. Yep. Mm. So, yeah, hopefully those folks down there are okay and they can start recovering and moving on. Yeah, because that would be some bad stuff. There. Yeah, it would. I hate it. I hate everybody can get out and stay safe. Yep, everybody keep those people in your thoughts and prayers. Yes, sir. Is this is really not over with. I mean, it's you know it's strengthening back and then heading toward us, but hopefully we won't get it near as bad as they did. So they got a long way to go. Yeah, they did. All right, bud. Um, you got any good things to say or any shout outs you want to mention? Yes, I do. I got one here. Let me see. It is a Apple Podcast five star review. Oh, ding ding. Yeah, that'd be cool. We need a bell. A ding ding. Let's get one of them. We'll go to the, go to the library and steal one. You got one? Okay. I don't know where they have those bells. <laughs> anyway, this comes from uh, Hilton81, H-Y-L-T-O-N, 81, in the five stars. Love y'all. If I could give you ten stars, I would. My husband and I spend Thursday nights listening to the new episodes. My husband loves those introductions, and thank y'all for such an amazing podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hilton81, for such an amazing five-star review. Yeah. Man, we appreciate that. But it could be a 10-star if she could do it. Ain't that, that'd be mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. We, we deserve a 10-star. Yeah, we do. But, yeah. <laughs> but if anybody else wants to go and give a five-star, they can go to Apple Podcast and click that five-star and leave a review. Write something in the box. People. Yeah, make sure you always do that. Yeah. That's important. Birthday or just hello. Yeah, whatever you want to do. Yeah. We or write something really cool like they did. Yeah. Or, that, that makes us feel Or, or try good. to outdo them. Yeah. Let's see if you can do, outdo them. We're getting 15 stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got, dude? Well, we also want to say a big thanks for, uh, for our friend Angie Williams Chaplin for coming all the way from Texas up here to see us. Yes. Well, actually, she came to see her family, but she made time. For, <laughs> well, she made time to give us a visit. And it was really cool. Yeah. For, uh, we had a little... I guess it was it a was it a meet and greet or like a eat and greet? Yeah, yeah, kind of sort of. Yeah, it was kind of both. it was one of them. Yeah, yeah, or both. But anyway, it was really cool to meet you, Angie, and uh, glad you had uh, made time for us. Yeah, we, in between your uh, liver mush sampling. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So anyway, I guess she's headed back to Texas by now. Hope yeah. Uh, by the time you hear this, you will be back home. Hopefully, yep. safe travels. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I don't know, unless you want to sell some shirts and stuff. If anybody wants to go to the website and get you a t-shirt, get you a mug, get you some kind of something to support the crack house, help keep the lights on, we would certainly appreciate Time it. Time to get you a hoodie. It's starting to get chilly. Yep, get you a hoodie. Down this way, anyway. Mm-hmm. Might need to go on there and get me one. Yeah. I think I've only got two or three of them. Get you a new hoodie. But anyway, I like to buy stuff for me. Yeah, I like, I like to buy stuff for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I was just on eBay right before we got started and bid on something for me. Yeah. Phil said... Dale said, yeah, go ahead and bid that. Go yeah. ahead. Come on. Do it. Do it. Do hit it. The, hit the button. So, yeah. yeah. And just like, nah, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Now I'm the highest bidder. So. <laughs> I hope you win. Well, <laughs> it's a lot of money. So, uh, you guys been listening to Dahmer? I mean, uh, have you guys been uh, watching Dahmer out there? I think we should have like a, get online and have a discussion or something about that. Yeah, on the, cool. the Dahmer series. Yeah, it's really place. good. Yeah. Yeah, I won't say nothing to spoil it because I don't know who's done, who isn't, but well, I know you're not done, but man, it's really good. Yeah, I'm halfway into it all right then yeah what we got to going on today it ain't no number but we got a good story for you we've got a heck of a story dude we've got a a story across the state line to the north of us across the line in virginia all right a couple and, hours up the road yeah from right here where we're recording but this is the short family murders and we're just going to start with the family themselves and let's talk about the father of this family is a family of three okay and michael wayne short he was the husband and father and he was born on february the 18th of 1952 and he had a his family he had one brother and two sisters and when he was an adult he would get married and have 
three kids that were all sons. Hmm. But this marriage would end in divorce. No okay. case. Yeah. And a little bit later, he m- married a lady named Mary Frances Hall. And she was born on April the 20th of 1966. Ooh, slight age in difference. Yeah, about 14 years. She Ooh. was 14 years younger than him. Ooh. Yep. And she came from a pretty large family, one of just seven kids. Seven? Yeah. And she grew up in this same area of southern Virginia. It must have been farmers or something. Yeah, it must have been. <laughs> now, Michael and Mary would eventually meet up, and they had a whirlwind relationship. And they would ultimately get married. So Michael and Mary got married. Yeah. And they had one child together, and it was a daughter. And her name was Jennifer Renee Short. So he finally got his daughter. Yes. After three sons. Yeah. And Jennifer was born on July 12th of 1993. And she was described as a sweet little girl that was pretty close to her parents. That's good. And the summer of when this took place of 2002... Jennifer was set to begin the fourth grade at Fisbro Elementary School there in Virginia. All right. Yeah, I'm sure he spoiled the heck out of her. Yeah, being the only girl, yeah. Because his sons are probably pretty much grown by this time. They are, yeah. So, yeah, that was pretty daggum cool. Yes, very much so. And the Short family, they lived together in Oak Level, Virginia. Now, this is just a small community just outside of Bassett, Virginia. And it's located about an hour south of Roanoke and about an hour north of Greensboro, North Carolina. Gotcha. Yeah, Greensboro is about two hours from here, I guess. Yep. Give or take. And the population of Oak Level is just under 1,000. So this area, dude, pretty much everybody knew everybody, I would say. Yeah, it's pretty small. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably rural. But Oak Level is just a little more than just a stop on a map for a lot of people. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, just... I think it were hotels around, and or motels, and maybe a couple of gas stations, and that was about it. Now, the Shorts, they lived just off of U.S. Route 220, and it was a pretty busy highway right through yeah, there. Yeah, when you say just off the, the highway, it's literally, there's a, their driveway goes onto a four-lane road. Yeah. Well, it's two this way, two that way, with a median in between, but four-lane road, yes. Yeah. I mean, right on it. And their address was... 10820 Virginia Avenue. Right. So if anybody wants to look at this little area, check it out. Google map it. Google, Google Earth it. But now, there in Oak Level, Virginia, Michael, Mary, and Jennifer were known as just a, a quiet little family. Mm-hmm. Uh, tight-knit, and it was described they just kept to themselves. But they were friendly and welcoming to anybody that they knew or, you know, anybody they saw out. They were just, just a friendly little family it's kind of like around here it seemed like mm-hmm. i mean i don't think population is probably pretty close to the same yeah they always seem to get along and including their larger extended families you know michael his older sons his three adult sons and it was reported they didn't have any public known squabbles or disputes or anything like that nobody was upset with anybody like that so, right. so it was just everybody was getting along and if it was they kept it to itself yep And it was reported that one of the Short's closest neighbors, her name was Ruby Emerson. She would later tell the Freelance Star newspaper, quote, that they were always outdoors in the yard mowing the grass or whatever. They seemed happy as could be. A family friend of the couple would later recall to reporters they were just good, quiet people. They never bothered anybody, as far as I know, just down-to-earth, everyday people. It was a hell of a quote. Yeah. yeah. was out there cutting the grass. Just, yeah, just <laughs> down-to-earth people, yeah. But there in Oak Level, Virginia, Michael and Mary both worked for the same company. Michael owned his own company, and it was called MS Mobile Home Movers. And the MS stood for Michael Short. Well. Yep. It's pretty convenient, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. He owned and <laughs> yeah, he owned and managed this <clears throat> business. And what he did, he transported mobile homes. He moved them for people that right. need them moved. But, well, you got to do that. You know, if you buy yeah. one, you just can't hook it up to the truck and take it home. Yeah, hence the name mobile home. That's yeah. right. Yeah, but um, the business had started to fall off a little bit by the year two thousand two. Right, and they had put their home that they lived in. They they had a brick home there. They'd put it on the market, Dale, right. because of some financial issues. And what they were going to do is sell their home and move into a mobile home of their own and try to get back on their feet 
and make some money and save up some dollars man yeah maybe yeah. you know, just take a step back to make some money right throughout 2002 michael would reportedly consider moving his family to south carolina yeah i think he made a, you know fairly i'll say a lot of trips but he went down there you know a couple of times visiting some places Mm-hmm. And I think uh, several of them was down around Myrtle Beach, Conway, and some other stuff. So it's kind of like coastal towns he was visiting, checking yeah. out. And that's where he was thinking about relocating to. Yeah, man. I think he was trying to get a job with a moving company or something. Yeah. And just possibly just to have a fresh start. Yeah. And uh, find a good place to raise their daughter, Jennifer. Right. So now we're going to the evening of Wednesday, August the 14th of 2002, Dale. Already. And Michael was with an employee of his. His name was Chris Thompson, and Chris was working with Michael on a vehicle of his. He would eventually leave and go to a motel down the road. So was he working on Michael's vehicle or Chris's vehicle? It's one of Michael's trucks, you think? I would say. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. But Chris was staying in a hotel just right down the street, and it was just, I guess, somewhere just after sunset when he left. Mm -hmm. Now, the last time Michael, Mary, and Jennifer would be seen together was about 11 p.m. that night when they drove to a Burger King drive through in nearby Collinsville. And me and you Google mapped this a little bit ago, and it was about a 15-minute drive. Right. And I thought it was kind of odd for the whole family to go eat dinner at 11 o'clock at night. But, you know, if it's summer and not, nobody's in school and they've been working out in the yard all day, you know, it's probably not going to get dark till probably 9 or so. And then they probably cleaned up and then decided to go get some food. So, you know, maybe not. They just all jumped in the truck and went. But they went through the drive through there. Right. Yep. And the family is believed to have gone to bed sometime after midnight. But the next several hours are just a mystery to everyone, Dale. Right. So they must have jumped in the truck, went down to the Burger King, got some food, come back. And they was probably all wore out, so it was just time to crash. Yep. Yeah. Now, Michael's employee, Chris Thompson, he returned to the short home just before 9 a.m. the next day right and he planned to meet up with michael and drive him to christianburg where they were going to pick up a truck for michael's mobile home moving business dale right and when he got to the short home he noticed that the garage door was open michael he had like a it was an attached garage there i think he turned into a little man cave he had like a sofa out there and a tv and place he'd just hang out well, plus I, he worked, I think he worked on his truck in there, too, but it also had, like, his couch, he said. Like yeah. So I guess he had, like, a little area over to the side or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was reported that uh, he would fall asleep out there because he had a snoring issue. Mm-hmm. And, I get that. And um, <laughs> would let Mary just have some peaceful nights of sleep. Right. So he'd just sleep on the couch. Well, probably he probably um, stayed out there working late on his trucks and stuff, and then He'd get tired, go over and sit on the couch and watch TV and probably just crash out, you know, fall asleep. And it's probably playing, sometimes not playing, because you know how it is when you sit down after working all day and you just start watching TV. You just kind of, in a few minutes, it's watching you and you're not watching it. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like it just gets further and further away. (laughs) But anyway, when Chris got to the Shorts home, he noticed that the garage door was open. Right. He's probably thinking, man, he's up early. Yeah. You know, where are you working? I'm a little bit late, but... But he figured Michael would just be inside either sleeping or working on the truck. Right. Inside the garage, Chris found Michael laying on the couch. Right. And thought he was asleep. But when he got closer, he realized. He wasn't. Mm-mm. Right. Mm-mm. And this is when he noticed that Michael had been shot. Yeah, in the forehead. Yeah. Mm, and he was dead. Now, officials with the Henry County Sheriff's Office were called to the scene yes. a short time later where they found the body of 50-year-old Michael Short in his family's carport garage there. And after doing a scope of the family's home, officials announced that another body was found inside the home. Man. And that was Michael's 36-year-old wife, Mary. Mm. Yeah, and she had been shot in the back of the head in the bed. Yeah. Like she was sleeping. So both of these people were shot in her sleep. But get this, Jennifer was nowhere to be found. Mm, nope. Nope. She was missing from the scene, and she was nowhere to be found. Police would begin to reach out to the Shorts' known relatives and friends, most of whom just lived in that same area. Right. But none knew where Jennifer was. Hmm. So, you know, this guy's flipping out. He comes yeah. over thinking he's going to work, walk in, and boss is dead, call the police, and find out 
everybody in the house is dead, but the daughter is missing, and he's the last one to see him alive. Mm-hmm. Now, the Henry County Sheriff's Captain, Kimmy Nestor, he would say nobody knows where the child is. That's not normal. The family is all in shock. Right. Now, after unable to find Jennifer after a couple hours, an Amber Alert would be issued that afternoon. Mm. And on August the 15th of 2002... Well, you know, a side note, this was the first time that the Amber Alert had been used in this area, too. Yeah. I don't know how long it had been uh, instated, but this was the first time they had to use one. Now, that Amber Alert would be issued for Jennifer that afternoon. Right. And like Dale said, it would be expand beyond the like the immediate area and even into Washington, D.C., oh, yeah. that far out. Hundreds of miles. Mm-hmm. Trying to find out what the hell's going on here. And even the news alerts would break out nationwide, and Jennifer's picture... Uh, was featured all over local news and regional news broadcast, and even CNN would run the story. Wow! So, it, well, you know they're freaking out, man, because you know her parents both have been shot dead in the house and in the bed, sleep, and she's gone. So yeah, you know, they're freaking out. Yep, I would be. Heck yeah! I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, searches would be carried out through the next few days, which included. Not only loved ones of Jennifer, but dozens of volunteers and numerous police officials. Yes. And in addition to bringing out all the ATVs and horses, they authorized a canine unit and helicopter to search for Jennifer. Right, yes. Yeah. So they're uh, they're going at it full force. Yep. And then guess what? Just like every time that somebody goes missing and they're out looking for them, here comes the rain. Yep. Starts raining. It is so odd how many times... We've done cases, and this happens. Yep. Now, none of the efforts were able to uncover any trace of Jennifer. Nothing. Yep. Now, Michael's body had been found outside in the family's attached enclosed carport, laying on the couch. But the body of Mary Short was found lying in the couple's bed inside their home. Right. And all indications, both had been taken completely unaware, and there was no sign of struggle that was found. Right. And... This indicated that both Michael and Mary had most likely been killed in their sleep. Yep. With the killer using a single small caliper weapon to kill both of them. Yeah, it was a twenty two. Yeah. Right. And it was some point between midnight and nine AM. So I don't know, it's it's kinda odd. You'd think, you know, one or the other would have woken up unless maybe there's a, a silencer or something involved. Yeah. I don't know how far apart really the garage in how I don't know. It's well, if the garage is on one side of the house and the bedroom's on the other. Yeah, depending on, you know, if they had window unit air conditioners or if doors, how many doors are between. It's possible, I guess, with a 22 that you don't, you don't hear it and wake up. Mm-hmm. But it's not, mm, I don't know. Yeah, it would be less loud than a 38 or a right. 357. I mean, it's still a gunshot, but it's not, Yeah. Uh, you know. But it was a 22 that was yeah. determined that. Uh, kill both of them and that's that's also odd to me that that would be the caliber of choice because mm-hmm. you know you don't think it really of um someone who was going to somewhere planning on killing somebody to have that small caliber of a gun i know now during the original search of the home police had been surprised to see jennifer's bedroom empty and no sign of jennifer was found inside the crime scene and investigators would note that her pillow was found on the floor, and her bed had been moved approximately two inches from its usual position. Right. I guess it maybe left an indention in the floor or something. Probably, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Maybe like uh, in the carpet or something, or so if there was carpet. Just keep in mind during this time, Dale, that this family was trying to sell their house. Mm-hmm. And they were, I guess, keeping it immaculate you know, because it was on the market. Very clean, yeah. Yeah. Because people would be coming by with... Uh, doing shows and stuff and looking at it so they had to keep yeah, it the clean. realtor would be bringing people over you know, yeah show and stuff so they yeah. had to keep it clean and straightened up and you also think that the crime scene is very very clean here it's really weird mm-hmm. there's nothing out of the ordinary besides that pillow in the bed moved besides the two dead folks yep now get this this is kind of eerie but the investigators would find that the phone lines to the house had been cut right and this was indicating that the killing of Michael and Mary Short, that there was some kind of premeditated oh, act. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. This wasn't just something that was just a random drive-by, pull-up, 
shoot and leave. Right. It wasn't somebody that, you know, had been, there was a, like a, a store was like right next door to their house. And I mean, right next door. Mm-hmm. So it's not like somebody was maybe leaving the store and come by and seeing the garage door open and was just kind of coming in you yeah. know, or whatever, being nosy and then run across them. Because, uh, you know, if you're not going to cut the damn phone line for that. So somebody could, had come here and planned on doing what happened. Yeah. Now, the police, they would keep the Shorts house closed off from everyone for about two weeks. And they were scanning every inch of the property for any kind of clues. And this is pretty impressive being such a small place, you know. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't think they had that they would be uh, this particular as being a small police force. I yeah. assume they're small because the town's so small. Yeah. And they pulled an untold amount of DNA evidence from the house. But officials with the Henry County Sheriff's Office have never specified what kind or how much. Right. And there was some unofficial affidavits. They would pull approximately 66 items from the home as a evidence, which included there were two 22 shell casings found near the bodies. Right. Uh, one in the bed next to Mary's body and one in the garage next to Michael's. Now, see, that right there is kind of odd, too. You know, I'm just going to jump in right quick because so far it seemed like a real professional job. Yes. Somebody comes in and clips the phone cords. So, I mean, it's one shot each. But why wouldn't you pick up your shell casing? Yeah, you'd think. Definitely. Unless there's no way to trace the gun. And you wipe the fingerprints off of them before you load it. Right. But you, usually if you're being this meticulous, you would pick them up. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. There was also a 12-gauge Winchester shotgun, a box of 12-gauge shotgun shells, a twenty two caliber rifle, a partial box of twenty two caliber ammo, uh, approximately $600 in cash, which had been left on the kitchen counter. Mm, now, see, there's another thing. Yeah. The business checkbook to Michael's business was laying there. There was a computer disk. I just hadn't been told what was on that computer disk. Right. There was some unidentified documents that were contained in a briefcase, which I'm sure it was related to Michael's business. Mm-hmm. And there was a, re- a reported note from the kitchen table. And it's never been, there been a release what, what was on that note? No, no. As far as I could find out. Yeah, so there you go. So again, he didn't take the money either. $600 cash laying there. Right. So everything looks like it's a hit, except for he didn't pick up the shell case. Yep. And that kind of bothers me. Now, the police would even pull a latent impression of a message written on a window in the garage, and it read, I am glad to see. Hmm. And it's unknown if this message is related to anything to do with the crime, but they pulled the print anyway. Right. So it could have been there for a long, long time or not. Yeah. I really don't know, but they're being pretty thorough here. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, early on, it was reported that Michael's dark pickup truck was missing from the home. But it hadn't been reported on anything about what happened to that. And so uh, I assume they found it. They or... did, yeah. It was lo- it was located in the county for. Okay. But I don't know exactly where it was from or where it was or why they didn't why they didn't think it was there. Yeah. Which is kind of odd because, you know, unless, I don't know, I don't know. They went, they took it to Burger King Mm-mm. and <laughs> come back. and then, But they couldn't find it, but I think it was later uh, actually accounted for, yes. Okay. Now, in the days following authorities would conduct searches throughout the area including a small pond near their home which was the only i guess sizable body of water in the area well you gotta check it and this search proved to be fruitless dale and the search carried out at the circle c motel near the family's home which was just right down the street Hmm. and it'd been known to i guess attract drug addicts and transients at that time yeah well he's got the that motel room yep and even motel owner Lorraine St. Clair would tell the reporters that the police just wanted to check everything out. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So at this point, we have no idea what's going on. We don't know if, if maybe she heard something going on and just, you know, took off and jumped out the window or whatever or ran down the road or, or she was taken. We don't know anything. Mm-mm. Right. They're not knowing if Jennifer was the target or if the parents were the target. Right. And at nine years old, you would definitely kind of know what the hell's going on mm-hmm. if you heard or saw or something and then just try to get out of there but yep. so it's hard to tell right now now from the beginning police theorized that jennifer might have escaped the house right when her mom and dad were shot and killed and that she might have fled and in, like into the woods of the wilderness area yeah and just was hiding yeah scared 
no doubt. But yeah, they were actually walk, walking the woods hollering for Jennifer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, you know, you never know. At this point, we don't know what the hell's going on. And you got to be thorough. Check everything. Check the water. Check the woods. You got to do what she, you got to do. She could be alive. She could be dead. We don't know nothing yet. And they brought out bloodhounds, and they found Jennifer sent there at the home and at the Circle C convenience store. Right. But they're only finding it where places they know she would have been because, you know, she was known to go to that store mm -hmm. a good bit. You know, everybody there knew her. Now, an investigator at the scene told reporters that we presume that she was kidnapped, abducted from her home after her parents were killed and taken against her will. And when speaking to the press, the Henry County Sheriff H.F. Cassell would state on CNN that this is a very unusual case. We don't see many like this. We've had a lot of horrific murders, but I don't remember a genuine child abduction in this area. Mm. So I guess they've been over their head. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm saying, you know, this is, I'm sure it is, a, you know, over, like I said, over their head, but I'm still impressed with everything they're doing here. Yep. Now, when they were, they issued this Amber Alert, they received tips from all over, as far away as Missouri, mm. but nothing really panned out. Well, I'm sure when it got on CNN and everywhere else, everybody's going to start chiming in. Yeah. That's the problem with, I mean, you want to get the word out and get it out as far as you can, but then you're going to get a whole lot of stuff coming in that's not uh, any good. Mm -hmm. Now, no apparent suspects would emerge, and... Chris Thompson, this was one of Michael's employees. Yeah, he's the one that was there the night before. Yeah, he was fully cooperating with the authorities. Right. Chris had been with the Shorts the night before their murder, working with Michael on a vehicle, like we said, in the garage. Mm -hmm. And Chris told the police that he had left late on the evening of August the 14th, and the entire family was still alive and well, and that Jennifer had already gone to bed. All right, now wait a minute. This goes, this goes back to that shit that bothers me about when they went to Burger King, everybody went. Mm -hmm. So what they do? Go wake her up out of the bed, get in the car to go to Burger King? That, that doesn't make any sense, does it? No, because before I was like, you know, I was talking to you about this earlier. I'm like, you know, everybody, they went to Burger King that night. It was however far it was down the road, not that far. But why did everybody go, especially if they were just going through the drive through wouldn't? Because, you know, if it was me, I'd like, I'm going to run in here and grab some food. I'll be right back. Yeah. You know, and then maybe I all went. But, you know, if he says she's already gone to bed. Like, I'm going to get some food. What do y'all want? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll be right back. But if she's already in the bed, that, that's kind of Let her odd. sleep, man. That's odd to me, yeah. Nine-year-old kid, let her sleep. Yeah. Hmm, okay. If she ain't complaining about being hungry. <laughs> right. Well, even, if she, even if she was, you're like, you know, you can make it well. I mean, she ain't complaining if she's been in the bed, but. Yeah, Michael say, Mary, I'm going to go to the store and go to Burger King. What do you want? And you stay here with her. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's. That's what I would do. Exactly. You know, it's, it's just, I mean, I guess it's not really a big deal, but to me, it's something that stands out. Mm hmm Yeah. Just overpicking. It just contradicts itself the whole yeah, exactly. way. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was questioned extensively by police, you know, in the weeks coming up, and he was uh, he was cleared. He was very open um, and cooperative, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, hell, he, he walked in and called them right away, so you know, yeah. I, I don't think this guy had nothing to do with it, but there's a lot of stuff that's kind of weird here. Now, because the shorts had just put their home on the market for sale, their real estate records were pulled to see if any recently toured the family's home. Dale. Mm, that's a good. That's another smart thing. Yeah. It's unknown whether or not it led to any new leads, but investigators seem to believe that whoever had committed the murder might have used the property's open house to get, a, like, I guess. A, Check out the layout. Yeah, man. see what, what the house looked like. Yeah. You could also see where the damn phone lines come in mm -hmm. if you walked around the house. See where yeah. the bedrooms were, see what everybody done, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And that's very possible, but I don't think nothing come, nothing come of it. But, you know, and even if he, if he did sign in or however they kept the records here, you know, it's possible that he, depending on what kind of open house or if it was all done by a realtor, you know, maybe as a under assumed name or something. Yep. But you, you never know. But that would be a good way to, to figure it all out. But it's smart thinking on them to pull the re, uh, real estate records. It would. Now, more than a week after the bodies of Michael and Mary were found on August the twenty third of two thousand two, their bodies were finally laid to rest with a public funeral. Mm. But the police had set up cameras to film the event, hoping to pick out any, I guess, red flags or anybody. With strange behavior, it's another thing hanging out. To do, right? Yeah, but they were unable to find anything uh, valuable at yeah. the ceremony. You know, because a lot of times they do. The killer will come back like a uh, the Gaffney Strangler. You know. Yeah. 
came in, went to the funeral, and went eat and everything. Well, heck, the Taco Bell Strangler did there in Charlotte. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They went to the the funeral home. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's it's smart, and another, another smart thing they're doing here. Yep. Now, later on, September the 4th, authorities would exhume the body of Michael Short. This is kind of weird. Yeah, for some additional testing. And when this happened, many online and in the local area began to think that Michael was not the father of Jennifer Dale, hmm. but a claim that would be half-hearted denied by Henry County Sheriff H.F. Cassell, who unexpectedly fed fuel to the authorities on by refusing to state whether or not the exhumation had been conducted to prove that Michael was the father. Right. And at the time, Sheriff Cassell claimed that this knowledge was part of the investigation and refused to answer any questions. Yeah, and then they say that the primary focus was to retrieve some hair samples, which they was they didn't do before. Mm-hmm. And that's... Mm, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That, this little that thing bothers me because, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't believe they dug him up to, to get some hair samples. Yeah, we're going to talk about that right here in just a second. Because back in the early 1990s mary had worked at a pluma incorporated plant that's a p-l-u-m-a yeah in the yeah in the bowles industrial park there yeah but i think it's out of business now she worked as a seamstress and i think she was often referred to the by the co-workers as little mary yeah little mary yeah a nickname that you know little mary don't you yeah little mary yeah on multiple occasions, a man looking for Mary had been asked to leave the plant's property, including once in 1992. Yeah, he actually went into the plant. Yeah. And had to have the plant manager just escort him out, and he left in his white pickup truck. So this is kind of odd. Yeah. This dude just starts showing like a stalker kind of thing going on here. Mm-hmm. Awful, awful weird. Yeah. And that is in 92, he say. Yeah, 1992. Hmm. But... Mary decided that she wasn't going to file out a restraining order against this guy. Hmm. Yeah, she just let it go. Yeah, she even went to the plant manager and asked him not to contact the police about it. Yeah. Which is, that's kind of odd. It's very weird. But despite investigators determining that Michael Short was definitely Jennifer's father, this strange encounter from Mary's past cast a grisly shadow over the early days of the investigation deal. Yeah, because it's all weird. Yeah. Very weird. But it was determined that Michael was the father of Jennifer. Right. Yeah, because they had thought that maybe Mary had had an affair with this guy that was stalking her there at the plant. Well, I guess plant. Like, because the timelines would match up. Yeah, it would. Right. Mm-hmm. So I can see him, you know, kind of looking at that. But you, would, I don't know. You would think that they had enough stuff, they wouldn't have to dig the poor guy up. I think it might have been more to it. They just wasn't telling everybody. Right. It had to be more to it. Because you know they had DNA and et cetera that they take. Yeah. Because this is not that long ago, if you think about it. No, it's not long at all. I'm pretty sure that the medical examiner was not that incompetent, that he didn't take some DNA from these folks. Yeah. All right, now, in September of 2002, there was a man living about an hour south of Oak Level, Virginia, and he made a weird discovery in his front yard. A dog belonging to Eddie Albert turned up what appeared to be hair from a wig yeah and him thinking it'd just be a wig he threw the hair into his trash mm-hmm. but as with his dogs would return a couple of days later on september the 25th which they had appeared to be a turtle shell right and eddie however quickly realized that yeah. it was a human skull yeah it was not a turtle shell no and police were called to eddie's home in stoneville north carolina and this is a small town in Rockingham County. This, this is just, uh, that county is what is right up against the Virginia state line, right? Yes. Yeah. Northern North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And Eddie directed them to the skull discovered by his dogs, as well as the hair in his garbage from the days prior. And a large search of the area would get underway, eventually locating the remains of a child, mm. which had been dumped near a pond along a rural road. In addition to the skull, hair and teeth and bone fragments were found under a nearby bridge as well as part of a rib cage. Right. But no more than a quarter of a skeleton was ever recovered. Yeah, this ain't good. No. But now, because of the closeness to the short's home, about 
35 miles north, many believe that this discovery could be the remains of Jennifer. And police originally denied these remains were a match for Jennifer, even though it seemed evident that they were. Right. And the skull of a young girl or woman also happened to have a small caliber gunshot wound to the head. Yeah. Which... Which would have been the same way that her mother and father were shot. Exactly. Yeah. And the remains were sent off for testing and weren't officially identified for over a week. And during this time, the loved ones of the victims had to fear it could be Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on October the 4th of 2002, authorities revealed that the remains had positively been identified as Jennifer Short. Right. While they could determine her cause of death, a gunshot wound to the head, other factors like sexual assault or or anything else were impossible to tell because she was just so decomposed. Yeah, there was nothing left. Yeah, just bone. And then, I mean, well, that was September when he found the thing in the yard with the dogs? Yes. So it was only, what, a month later? Yeah. Wow. But this is hot weather, man. Yeah, that's true. That's going to decompose fast. And then thrown out by the creek, I'm sure. It was a... Uh, Cleaned out by many, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Especially so, them dogs. So, yeah. Yep. So now we know she didn't run away. Exactly. Now, early on, a lot of speculation in this case surrounded motivations of an unknown. Why they decided to kill everyone in the house and but singled out Jennifer for abduction. And while this speculation remained unanswered following the discovery of Jennifer's body in September of 2002, many people believed that Jennifer had been targeted by their killer hmm. since she was only the only one abducted. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think, man? I ain't, I don't have a clue on this. Yeah. It's it's still. I don't. I don't. I don't think there's enough information where you could really go one way or the other yet. But the sophistication behind this, cutting the phone lines, right? I mean, it indicated that someone had to go to a lot of uh, thinking to pull this off it wouldn't just it wouldn't just to pull up in the driveway and do this man right. yeah they went there for a reason yeah now whether it was to go in there and kill these two people and didn't know that there was a child in the house but why would you take the child exactly and not just if you and if you were going to kill her why not just do it there yeah but the investigators believe that someone had previously seen or known jennifer and even become infatuated with the idea of her and mm. And, but Jennifer rarely ever strayed from her parents and had a loving and healthy relationship with both of them, man. So what, people thinking a sexual predator, maybe? Could be. Eh. Just stalking her? Yeah, but if you, I don't, I don't buy that. Because if it was that, I don't think, usually those type of people are not going to come in and kill mom and dad and take her with her. He would find another way to get to her. But keep in mind, they live right next to the Circle C convenience store. And right. she would go, she would walk over there. Right. So if that was the case and he was already stalking her, hell, he'd just wait for her to come to the store. Yeah. And, and grab her and walk go, back to the and house. go, yeah. Well, the way I see it. Yeah. But the media speculated about the possible theories for weeks after Jennifer's abduction, but would seemingly become distracted in the months and years ahead as investigators they began narrowing the scope of their investigation down to one person hmm. and um, a man that was at times described by police as either a witness, a person of interest, or even a suspect. Mm -hmm. Whichever one they needed at the time, I guess. Yeah. Now, this man, his name was Garrison Storm Bowman, and he was 66 years old, a carpenter, an outdoorsman who had become a, a pretty integral part of this story in the weeks after Jennifer's Skeletal remains were discovered under that bridge in Rockingham County. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was originally named as a material witness by authorities, but Bowman clearly became investigators' main suspect. Well, a lot of that come from, you know, another guy who was kind of throwing this guy under the bus. Yeah, he was. So, so a lot of this we have to take with a grain of salt, but go ahead. Yeah. Now, police officials allege that Bowman had fled to Canada. Day, which he did. Yeah. Days after the murders and weeks before the authorities managed to find Jennifer's body. And days later, police would receive a call from Bowman's landlord who said that two days before the murder, Bowman had mentioned paying a man in Virginia to move his mobile home. Right. And that if he didn't follow through or return his money, he would have to kill him. And this seemed to provide a clear... Uh, indication of some ill will toward someone in the moving home moving business well that's true but also this dude was pissed off because 
this guy had been planning this trip for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, when he got ready to leave, this, uh, what was the landlord's name? Lemon? Lemon. He assumed that um, Garrison was just going to give him his mobile home. Yeah, just and, leave it to him. Yeah. it over to him. Well, when he found out that he was actually going to give it to a, a friend in Michigan, he got pissed off about it. And that's when he started telling on him and calling all this stuff. And make, I think he made up something about it. He had a gun and some other stuff, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and actually when he didn't just take off and go to Canada, he actually went, you know, when he left, he went to, uh, up by his friend in Michigan who he was going to give the mobile home to. And then after that, you know, Ontario was just across the line. So if he was trying to hop into Canada, he would just go right in. But he didn't. He left there and went to Montana and visited one of his sisters for a while. And then when finally he went into Canada to visit his friend in uh, British Columbia, he got a phone call there from uh, his friend in Michigan letting him know that the FBI was looking for him. So he could have run then, but he didn't. He actually went to the Royal, Royal Canadian Mounted Police and uh, talked to them, and they put him in contact with the FBI, and he had an over-the-phone interview with the FBI agent. Yeah. And then after that, he went on to where he was going in Inuvik. Inuvik? Is that right? I think in, that's how you pronounce Inuvik it. Inuvik in Canada. And then after there, he was kind of detained because he— of his immigration status and basically he had uh, failed to disclose that he had a dwi on his record he had lied about being arrested right but you know that's what in you know even in his background the only thing he'd ever got in trouble for was dwi and that's just because he was an alcoholic Pretty yeah much, you know get up in the morning and start drinking beer and stuff so this guy was really making it sound like he just took off and left and went you know right then but he really didn't so i don't really i don't really know to me, this guy's not as big a suspect as this lemon guy's making him out to be. Yeah. Now, you know, he might have been. Actually, he did finally get his uh, mobile home moved to a friend of his house, you know, and uh, had a farm and let him just keep it there until the guy from Michigan could uh, get it up to his house. But um, that actually, you know, turned out to be it was like, what, less than a mile from where they found the yeah. remains. So there's a lot of circumstantial stuff that don't look good, but I just I don't know about this guy. Yeah. Now, there's a, a friend of Garrison Bowman. His name was John Beasley, and he would explain away Garrison's actions, including his move to Canada, claimed that Bowman had been planning this trip for years. Right. And it was just coincidental that he, he left around the same time as the murders. Mm -hmm. And Beasley also claimed that Bowman's trailer had not been abandoned, as it had been posted by police that he had offered to keep it on his property until a buyer from Michigan could come and pick it up. Yeah, so it's, I don't know, a lot of crazy stuff here. Now, they did say that they found a map in uh, some of his property, Mr. Bowman's. Yeah. Uh, but, I don't know, I've heard map and I've heard nine maps and I've heard 11 maps. I don't know which one it is. Mm. But there was a, like an X marked on one of the maps and they said it was fairly close to where that uh, the Shorts home the Shorts was. home were, but actually... It was more than five miles away. I mean, yeah. which is still pretty close, but it doesn't mean you know. And I mean, truthfully, if you, if you was going to go kill somebody and you had it on a map and you marked the map, would you leave the damn map in your trailer when you left? Exactly. So, he said his uh, ex-wife had been known to mark X's on maps, and he never did mark an X on anything. He just put an underline on it, and he would even mark places that he wanted to go canoeing. So, you know, it's just all circumstantial. A whole lot of circumstantial stuff, yeah. yeah. You know, and then some people said, like I said, you know, he was an alcoholic. said he would start drinking beer at 7 in the morning and then drink until he, he passed out. You know, so nobody's believing that this guy's going to get up in the morning and drink beer all day and then drive to Virginia and, and do this really clean crime, you know, and, and abduct this little girl and then take her back down, you know, and do whatever. Yeah. So I don't know about this guy. Now, on October the 15th of 2002, the police announced that they were planning to travel to Yellow Knife. Mm -hmm. It's a city in Canada's Northwest Territory. And they were going to find and speak to Garrison Bowman, mm -hmm. who had been planning to live off the grid for a time. Yeah, he was, I mean, and this uh, Yellow Knife is way up there. Isn't yeah. It? In the Arctic Circle, right? Yeah. Yeah, so he was going way off the grid. Yeah. And there he had been arrested, like we said, for drunk driving as well as violating immigration laws. Correct. And lying about his criminal history. Now, on October the 30th, Garrison Bowman appeared in court in Henry County. Yeah, they deported him back to U.S. Yeah. Sent him back home in handcuffs. But, <laughs> they, they're not playing that drinking, driving, and lying on your immigration up there. But he was released from police custody later that day 
but he would remain released on his own recognizance until November the 12th when he appeared in front of a grand jury in Roanoke, Virginia in a hearing related to the short family murders. But no indictment would follow the convening of this grand jury, no. indicating that there was not enough evidence to consider charging Garrison Bowman for with involvement in the murders, man. Yep, just like we said. Yep. Now, later that month, Garrison Bowman was convicted for his drunk driving offense from Canada and was sentenced to a seven-day jail sentence. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, even, even though it was his second one, you know, but yeah. it, since uh, 97, but it's, uh, it's all he got. Now, in the years to come, no charges were filed against Garrison Bowman for the involvement of the murders of Michael and Mary and Jennifer Short. And he would continue to deny involvement in the crime, not only to police during repeated bouts of questioning, but to the public on and on rare occasion that he answered any questions from reporters. I mean, hell, he's, this guy's, I mean, I know he's an older guy already, and, you know, he's, he does what he does, but this kind of thing is one of those things that kind of ruin your life, man, because you, it's going to be over your head from now on whether you did it or not well that's what he said he told the news and record of greensboro in 2004 he said this will hang over for me for the rest of my life unless they find the person who did it right well see this the uh, lemon guy that was his landlord he even told the police that he was putting a false bottom in his vehicle a yeah. false floor see yeah and he's just pissed off all that's it? all it was yeah mad because he didn't get to my home Now, it wasn't until 2005, this was nearly three years after the murders, that the spotlight would begin to sort of move away from Garrison Bowman. That year, U.S. Attorney Mark Brownlee unveiled a case against two men, Timothy Fennon Sampson and Jerry Riley Mills, who he alleged had lied to investigators. Mm -hmm. And these two had claimed that to see Garrison Bowman leaving the short home carrying a young girl on the night of the murders. Yeah. And their false statements to investigators had led to the case being built around Garrison Bowman. They had wasted hundreds, if not thousands, of man hours. Yeah, right? exactly. And all these dudes are just trying to get the damn reward money. That's all they were doing. They made it all up. But they were charged with uh, crimes including conspiracy, perjury, and providing false information to law enforcement. Good. They were also reported to have threatened two men investigating the crime, wanting to pocket the reward money by linking Garrison Bowman to the case. Right. Everybody's throwing this dude under the bus. Yep. They seem not to care if they ruined Bowman's life in the process or not. Right. Just trying to get some money. Now, another man, Tony Lee Epperson, he was charged with lying to investigators and was similarly involved with the case by the U.S. Attorney John Brownlee in 2005, and all three men were ultimately convicted and sentenced to many months in prison. Hmm. And it is believed that the claims by these three men had led to investigators fixating on Garrison Bowman early on. And in a way, they helped ruin this investigation beyond repair, Dale. Yeah, this is trash, man. Yep. And then finally, 2007, I think police finally admitted that, you know, after years of scrutiny and by, him, by themselves in the public, that Mr. Bowman was no longer a suspect. And then uh, he passed away in 2014. December of 2014. Yeah. Uh, I think it was on Christmas Day. Okay. When he passed away, yeah. Now, on July the 22nd of 2003, this was nearly a year after the murders, the creek where Jennifer's skeletal remains were found, uh, Henry County Sheriff Cassell said that multiple articles were recovered, including in the search, but declined to elaborate any further on the well, nature of the, of the unsolved case. So they moved the creek and found some stuff, but they're not going to tell you what it was. Exactly. Right. Now, a few months later, in September, the remains of jennifer were exhumed for forensic purposes but the authorities weren't keen to reveal whether or not any additional evidence was recovered during this sweep Hmm. now you know you remember they they exhumed her dad right yes he was trying to figure out now he did come back later and kind of explain why he didn't say that they were doing that or why he didn't say that they were doing it for paternity reasons and the reason he at the time he said you know we didn't want to say that's why, because we thought maybe whoever had abducted this girl was her real father, or thought he was their real father. And he, you know, they said, you know, if the guy heard that Michael was actually her dad, that he would kill her. You yeah, know, could be, in, it, it, be no use to him. Yeah, thinking that he, you know, he killed her because he thought he was his kid. Exactly, that, that was their working theory, anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's a good theory. Yeah, it's pretty smart. I mean, he had to lie at the time, but he had good reason. He yeah. was just trying to save the girl. Mm-hmm. You know. Now, in 2006, it was announced that several members of the Henry County Sheriff's Office, the main investigative body looking into the short family murders, 
had been indicted for corruption, Dale. Hmm. Among the officers implicated was none other than Sheriff H.F. Castle. So the sheriff himself. Yep. Who had been the public face for the investigation. Hmm. And approximately a dozen officers had conspired to sell drugs and guns seized from criminals, which they filed in official paperwork as having been destroyed. Okay, so they was uh, taking drugs and then reselling them. Exactly. And guns and reselling them. Yes. I guess guns they had confiscated and was selling them, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. And while doing so, had personally profited each of their conspiracy and helped bolster the drug distribution and money laundering ring in the region. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they was making a damn killing off mm-hmm. that. So it makes you wonder if they were not if they were covering up for somebody during the short family murders. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why Michael was making trips to South Carolina. Yeah. You know, and it... You know, that kind of work, you know, moving trailers and stuff would be a pretty good cover if he was, if he were moving confiscated drugs. Yeah. Especially if his, uh, if his business wasn't making a lot of money. It'd be a good way to have a little income. Talk bad about the guy if he's passed away, but it's possible. I mean, it's a theory. It's a working theory. Yeah. Yes. Now, on March the 18th of 2009, the FBI released several sketches to the public, including a composite sketch of a potential suspect. And a man seen near the Short family home at around the time the murders took place. This man was described as being in his 40s with a weathered complexion. And the sketches revealed not only what he looked like, but what he might have looked like seven years later. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really good if they can do that. Yeah. Also included in this public release was a sketch of a white single-cab flatbed body truck with wooden rails which the FBI theorized that might have been a 1998 to 2002, making it a newer model than the time of the murders. And it is believed the truck was seen near the Short family home in the early morning hours of August 15th of 2002. Now, how many years later is this? That's a long time to remember what somebody looked like that you've seen sitting around outside. This was like uh, in 2009, and the murders took place in 2002. So they released the sketches. No, I guess it doesn't say that... Uh that's when they took them but you would think you know why wait that long to release 10 years right yeah to release a sketch Hmm. yeah that might that makes no sense that's odd yeah so what what happened to the to the cops did they all get did they go to jail what happened in there yeah um sheriff casale he done some time i don't remember how much it was i know they brought in all new officials to come in and lead this investigation you know and hand it off to other authorities and stuff but i was I knew that, but I never did see exactly what happened to all these guys. It's crazy. So really, they could have been fudging this whole investigation if they were in on it. Yeah. In May of 2010, the FBI would visit several coastal cities in South Carolina where they spoke to several people about the short family murders. Right. And the cities visited included Bennettsville, Conway, Florence, and Myrtle Beach. Right which coincidentally were the cities that Michael had traveled to in the months before the right, murder. Yeah, like I said before, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and it's kind of odd, but, you know, really, if, if the cops, I hate, I hate to keep saying if the cops were involved, but if the cops were involved in this, why would they take Jennifer across state line? That would then be invested. I mean, that would be bringing the FBI in automatic. Mm-hmm. But, of course, also an abduction of anyone to think it's under 12 or under 14, I'm not sure automatically gets the fbi in yeah so either way taking her out of the house brings the fbi in right yeah. now and they would have known that you think so, yeah so i don't know you know or maybe you think maybe hell i don't know i'm, this, I'm just thinking out loud yeah this case is just crazy all the way around yeah, it's dude. just got me thinking because you know we're thinking it looked like a professional hit did they hire somebody to go in and kill this guy and his wife and then maybe he didn't know there was a kid in the house i know and you know because from everything i've read you know usually on hit men for the job guy or whatever, they don't do kids. Mm-hmm. You know, so if they went in and found a kid, you think they took the kid and then handed it off to somebody else and said, I'm have. done? Yeah, could have. That would make sense. Or just uh, to take the kid and throw off the investigation. And maybe maybe Jennifer saw him and they had to get rid of her. Yeah. But in 2015, the authorities announced that they were shifting their focus from Michael and Mary to their nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer. To say she was the, the main reason? Yeah. Hmm. After spending approximately 13 years investigating Michael's movements and business dealings throughout the area, including South Carolina, as well as the alleged stalking incident 
you know, the was, yeah, yeah, investigators decided to change the focus to the most obvious motivation because Jennifer had been the only person abducted by this unknown person, hmm. and she had likely been the target of the killer, which her parents becoming collateral damage in the process. But I, I just ain't buying that, dude. I don't either. I, I don't. I don't see the reason for it. Mm-mm. I think this corrupt uh, law enforcement there in Henry County, they there was something going on, dude. I really do. Yeah, because it's very mysterious. I mean, it's not really. It's like you know, we don't know nothing. We're just trying to piece together pieces of stuff. But there's a whole lot of weird stuff going on here. Yeah. Now, approximately one year after the murders of the Short family, there was a bridge that was renamed in Jennifer's honor. And the bridge is in North Carolina, Rockingham County, along Grogan Road, which under Jennifer's remains had been found. Yeah. And the bridge, now known as Jennifer Renee Short Memorial Bridge, has become home to many memorial events and bike rides. Well, that way she'll never be forgotten. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is cool. Exactly. And those that live or lived in the same small community as Michael and Mary and Jennifer continue to raise awareness for the story in hopes that it might inspire someone to come forward. Yeah, one of their old neighbors, you know, organizes a bike ride every year to keep her name in. Mm-hmm. And they give uh, the money for uh, for uh, scholarships for kids going to Bass High School. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But, I mean, it's really good to do stuff. This whole, this whole damn case is crazy. Yep. On the morning of February the 20th of 2019, this was just a few years ago, mm-hmm. A member of the Collinsville Fire Department responded to a call received at approximately 4 a.m. And the destination was the vacant home of the Short family, Hmm. which had been uninhabited for almost two decades. Yeah. And what had happened, the house had been set on fire. And firefighters were able to put the fire out, which they battled for several hours, but the fire left the home destroyed. Yeah. And despite recovering... A gas can at the scene, investigators and fire marshals were unable to determine how the fire had been started. And the, an exact cause has never been found. Right. And I think uh, somebody had bought it and just never did anything with it, right? And yeah. And all of a sudden it burnt down. Yep. That's just crazy. After all them Something years. Something else odd. You know? Yeah. And like I said, it's been two decades, man. I know. And you know, the case is still open and active. Investigators are still working on the case. And there's a... $80,000 reward on information leading to the arrest conviction of the person's person or persons if there were more than one responsible, you know. So it's still an active case with a, a big reward if anybody knows anything. Yep. If anybody has any information, they can contact the Henry County Sheriff's Office there in Virginia. They would love to talk to you if you know anything. Heck yeah. With them or the FBI. Yep. Right. All right, Dale. That is the sad, short, sad story. The short family murders, man. Yeah. Man. Yeah, this the uh, I learned about this case a while back, and it just it just intrigued me that this unsolved it's, and the corruption in that county. Yeah, and you know we had I was really putting these <laughs> putting these guys over to that because <laughs> they done a lot of good stuff. They done a lot of smart things. They were they did a lot of stuff that everything you should do. Mm-hmm. So until we you know these, I don't know. Yeah, doing right things here and selling drugs out the back of the car. <laughs> Almost reminds me of the Candace Hilts. Yeah. Case mm-hmm. police corruption. Yeah. Right. All right, dude. We are going to get out of here. All right, Donnie. Let's roll. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the, the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles. Chronicles.